Good morning, everybody. Hi. I'm Nelly Yo. I'm with the, with the BMG IHI International Forum Advisory Board. And I'm from Singapore. Uh, so on behalf of the board, as well as the forum uh, organize, organizing committee, welcome to our session. Now, this is uh, D10. It's a leadership theme, Delta 10. So uh, there are two parts to this morning's session. So make sure that you're in the right session, D10. The first part of the session is leadership, creating contagious commitment, senior healthcare leaders as mobilizing leaders of change. And this will take us from 10.30 to 11.15. And the second part of the program is the quality continuum, how it all joins up. And this will take us from 11.15 to lunch. So now for the first part of the presentation, if you do have questions, you know, you can ask the questions after the presenter's um, uh, uh, presentation. So we won't wait till the, all the presentations to have the discussion. You are at liberty to raise your hand and then we will have the runners uh, uh, bring the mic to you and then you can ask your questions when the first presenter have done the presentation, okay? So now it is really with great pleasure and honor that I'm uh, given this opportunity to chair the session and to introduce our speakers. So our first speaker is Helen Bevan. And Helen, I've worked with her for a few years now. She's just, you know, uh, uh, full of energy and she can excite you and she can really uh, bring up your emotional bank. Now, Helen is the Chief of Service Transformation at the NHS Institute for Innovation and Improvement. Uh, and of course, we know that this is an organization that supports more than 1.3 million staff at the NHS to accelerate the delivery of world-class health and healthcare by encouraging innovation and developing capability at the front line of patient care. Now, Helen, Helen currently works with a group of senior leaders from ambitious, high-performing hospitals in England to develop transformation strategies. She's also leading programs to improve quality, safety, and efficiency of frontline patient care in a hospital and community settings. Now Helen has with her a guest, and I'll have Helen introduce her guest. Helen, please. Oh, thank you, Nelly, and, um, and good morning to you all. It's, uh, it's great to see so many people here for this topic. So I'm going to present this morning uh, with my colleague, Maxine Connor. And Maxine is Head of Organisational Development at one of the leading hospitals um, in England, South Tees Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust. And basically what's going to happen is that I'm going to present um, some, some of the kind of ideas and principles and theories. And uh, Maxine's going to help to make it real by, uh, by giving us some commentary. So our topic creating contagious commitment. You know, as, as leaders um, in, in health and healthcare, we face such a, a big agenda of change. And you know, sometimes it feels so difficult because we're, we're pushing to make change happen all the time. But you know, what if we stood back and we thought about it a different way? And we thought of um, uh, improvement like, like a really good disease that was viral. And, um, and we created this contagious commitment to change and, and uh, like an unstoppable force. Um, I think it's possible and I'll show you how. And in terms of this approach, it has very big um, implications for us as healthcare leaders because we redefine ourselves as mobilising leaders of change. But more about that later. So. I want to start off by thinking about traditions of change. And what I'd like to do is to contrast um, two um, traditions. The first one we call the, 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 what I call the management of change, which is the, 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 the set of principles and ideas, theories that underpin most of the work that we do in healthcare improvement. But what I also want to do is I want to contrast that with an additional perspective, um, which I'm going to call um, organising and mobilising. So let's look at the two approaches. So 
most of the work that we do, or the, the, um, the academic um, underpinning, the evidence base um, for our improvement work, comes from a fine tradition of change that I call here the management of change. And you know, the evidence base that we work with has existed for over 100 years. So, you know, if we go back to the, the very early days, for instance, um, Taylorism, okay, Frederick Taylor, scientific management, um, you know, I mean, he died in 1919. But, you know, these ideas of improvement science, we look at um, uh, Edwards Deming, we look at um, Duran, um, you know, we look at um, um, approaches like, like Lean, like Six Sigma, total quality management, you know, very much come from this set of ideas um, that, that I'd call improvement science. From the late um, 1980s onwards, we have clinical and medical audit. Then we add to that ideas about, um, about leadership and management studies and, and what makes a, 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 a good leader. And the final element um, in this mix, um, I would t title organisational behaviour. And this is really about you know, the psychology of change, what motivates people um, to, to work hard um, to under, undergo change. And I'd say, you know, this tradition of change is, um, is a very uh, great tradition of change and it's taken us a long way. But on its own, is it enough when we look at our next, the next stage of the journey that we face as leaders of health and healthcare improvement and we see the, the size of, um, and the challenge, um, is it enough? And um, I would um, um, uh, suggest that we maybe look at some additional ideas. And, and these ideas, I call here organising and mobilising, again, they come from a very fine academic um, tradition. And the evidence base underpinning these ideas, again, is more than 100 years old. But this body of knowledge is in, is in the sociological tradition. And it comes from um, ideas from community organising, from campaigns and, and social movements. Um, it's, it's taking learning from the leaders of the, the popular um, civic faith-based faith um, uh, mobilisation efforts. You know, those leaders who were in situations who saw great wrongs happening in the world and were able to put them right who um, often had, had no resources, had little power in the system, but by mobilising and organising those around them were truly able to change the world. And um, um, my, um, my thesis this morning is that actually if we take these ideas and we incorporate them into the way that we go about health and healthcare improvement, okay, they're not an alternative to um, many of our existing traditions and ideas about improvement, they're an addition. But I think that they give us the potential to think about, um, about change, about the scale and the pace of change um, in, a, in, a, um, in, in a very helpful way. And, you know, what's interesting, when we think about these two traditions of change, the, the management of change and mobilising and organising, almost what they're like is like, you know, um, train tracks, you know, in a, in, in a railway system. And each tradition has grown for over 100 years and the evidence base has continued to grow and be enhanced. But they've just grown separate in parallel, you know, they've never come together. And what we're starting to see, and we're seeing it happening um, across the world, is that the two sets of ideas are starting to come together. And, and leaders of community organising um, and, and social movements are taking ideas from, um, from organisational um, change management. And um, people who work in organisational change management are, are taking ideas from community organising. So what I want to do and, uh, and um, what Maxine will comment on is some of the work that we've been doing in the National Health Service in England to take um, some of these very powerful ideas from organising and mobilising and blending them um, with our approach to um, health and healthcare improvement. Now, there are some really important principles and I'd like to start with, uh, with one of these. And, you know, this is, um, when we think about change and, and how we make change happen as leaders, um, 
you know, um, when we think about you know, some of these ideas from social movements and, and um, community organising and applying them in an organisational context, I think this is a, a great quote um, to, to, to start that discussion. Often change need not be cajoled or coerced. Instead, it can be unleashed. Wouldn't it be amazing in, in all our organisations if we could all unleash the power of change? And one thing I think we need to think about to enable that to happen is, is the idea of commitment. And this quote here comes from Edgar Schein at um, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. You can't impose anything on anyone and expect them to be committed to it. I think that's very, these are very wise, wise words. And yet when we look at our healthcare system and the way that we ask our clinical leaders to be compliant, the way that we force top-down targets um, on them and expect people to um, accept it and to change, okay, um, I think is problematic. So what I would do in terms of thinking about these ideas is to contrast an approach to... Um, improvement that I would call compliance with an approach to improvement that I would call commitment. And, and certainly where we've been in the National Health Service in England in the last 10 years is, is a very strong compliance regime. In a sense, what our government has done has set a whole series of targets, um, performance standards, and they're set at the very top of our system. And we say to um, all, the, all our organisations, our primary care organisations, our hospital systems, you must achieve these targets. Okay? We state a minimum performance standard that everyone must achieve. And in terms of how we coordinate and control change, we use the system. We use hierarchy, you know, we use the, the systems as they exist, and we standardise procedures. And the, the, um, the consequences if we don't comply, are, um, are very significant. You know, and they run from, from very clear um, penalties or sanctions or shame, but they certainly create a focus and a momentum for delivery. And the underpinning idea okay, is about organisational accountability. You know, my accountabilities as a manager or a clinician are clear. And if I don't deliver this performance goal, I fail to meet my performance objectives. And what um, our, our leaders from community organising and social movements would say to us is we need to refocus on commitment. Okay, and actually using commitment to drive change. Of course we will always have um, compliance, but um, what the evidence says, actually if, if our workforce and our colleagues um, are committed to change, it's a hell of a lot easier to do compliance. And when we talk about commitment, it's about understanding you know, what's our collective goal that everyone can aspire to. And we coordinate and we control change through shared goals, shared values and a sense of shared purpose. And because we have a common purpose, it will create tremendous energy for change. And, and the basis of, um, of, of this change is, is um, what we'd call a relational commitment. And in the community organising world, you know, we hear this term again and again, relational commitment. And what that's basically saying is I make a commitment to other people in a relationship with them. And if I don't deliver um, that commitment, then I will let the group or the community and its purpose down. So if we focus on commitment, you know, it, it isn't less tough or less disciplined than compliance. Okay? And in a sense, if people commit to change, then we have to hold each other to account. But it's a very, very different way of, of thinking. And, you know, certainly in my system now, where um, there is a big reform process going on, you know, many of the old mechanisms that existed of performance management and, um, and assurance and compliance are, are being taken away. Um, and, and in a sense, as leaders, we need to learn um, how, to, how to lead by commitment, and I think it's a different way of thinking. So, you know, let's kind of stand back and say... How do we create improvement at scale? What do we need to do? And again, when I look, certainly across um, my system in the NHS in England, the, the prevalent mindset, the, the, the key thing that we think about 
um, in terms of quality and cost improvement is what I would call a clinical system mindset. And, and this is very important. And, you know, we won't achieve our quality and cost improvement goals without this mindset. And the focus here is around how do we improve the effectiveness and efficiency of the system. And our focus here is on you know, um, being very clear about metrics and, and measurement. It's about how do we improve clinical systems? How do we reduce unnecessary clinical variation? Redesigning um, pathways across the continuum of care and um, utilising practice that is evidence-based. All of those things and that mindset and those skills are critical to deliver our quality and cost improvement goals, but they're not enough. And, and what I would like to contrast with is what I'm calling here the mobilisation mindset for improvement. And here, the focus is how do we create the energy for change? How do we capture the imagination and the engagement of people that use our services, of, of um, our workforce. We talk here about moving. And when we mean moving in this context, we mean how do we make a fundamental connection within what, what's in people's hearts, with the things that, that make us or call us to do the jobs that we do, that bring us to work every day. And by doing that, how can we mobilise people, call them to action, work collectively to create the future? And when I look, at, certainly at the NHS in England, at the, the size of the change agenda and what we have to deliver in terms of quality and cost improvement in the next four years, if I was to do a risk assessment, I would say it's far more likelihood, likely that we will fail to achieve our goals because we get this side wrong than because we get this side wrong. And I'd say that in terms of our cost and quality actions over the next period, we really, really need to think about how we make this happen. In a sense, how we create contagious commitment to change. Now, I want to make a distinction here, which is a really important distinction. And that is the distinction between mobilising and organising. And um, I'll, um, I'll maybe tell you a story here. Um, about five years ago at the um, NHS Institute, we carried out some research. And the research was called From Skeptics to Champions. And it was research that was about a group of clinical leaders who used to be real skeptics about quality improvement. And they became champions of quality improvement. And the, the nature of the research was to find out what were the factors that led to a clinical leader moving from being a sceptic to a champion of improvement. And it was very nice research and we found out some interesting things. But what was more interesting to me was that when we did this research, we discovered a subpopulation. And the subpopulation were clinical leaders who used to be sceptics, they then became champions for quality improvement, but because their expectations weren't met and it wasn't followed through properly, they then became sceptics again. And what we found was that the clinical leaders who had started off being sceptics, who then became champions, but then became sceptics again, were far more sceptical than the people that we just left being sceptics in the first place. And, you know, there's some really important lessons here because these techniques and approaches and tools from community organising um, and social movements are very powerful. But it isn't enough to just mobilise people for change, to get people excited. We have to follow up and we have to be very um, um, organised to make the change happen. And if we don't, it can be quite dangerous. So... What can we learn from these great social movement leaders who both um, mobilised and organised for change? How did they change the world? And if we look you know, at, at, these, at these great leaders, we look at the, the leaders of the, the women's suffrage movement, of the um, American civil rights movement, of the, the gay rights movement, what we see time and time again is that what those leaders did was to combine great strategy 
okay, from the brain, with wonderful storytelling from the heart. And bringing these two components together, they created a platform of shared understanding that leads to action. And I think that both Maxine and I um, will, will reiterate this today, the importance of both strategy um, and narrative. Um, how many people in this audience have been to business school and got an MBA? Okay, oh, it's, it's quite a big group. I, I did. And, um, and we learn about strategy in business school. But the kind of strategy here is a very different way of thinking about, um, about strategy. And, and this is a definition, if you like. It's a mobilising and organising um, definition of strategy. It's the process of turning the resources we have, and very often, you know, we have, we have phenomenal resources to support us in change. We just don't recognise it. Into the power we need, and we'll come back and talk about power, to win the change that we want. And I would say, in terms of the very big quality and cost um, goals that we face, this is a really neat way of, of thinking about things. Because it is fundamentally about um, galvanising our resources um, to, to, to change power. So let's kind of look at each of those in turn. So let's think about resources first. Now, in, in, in the way that we normally think about, about resources for, for quality and safety and cost improvement, we would think about economic resources here. Okay? And the thing about economic resources, we have a finite amount of resource to help us with change. And um, as we use the resources, they, they, um, they diminish. So we have a pot of money, we have our project budget, we have um, a group of people that can help us, our improvement advisors or our improvement team. And maybe we have some, um, some technology, some, some materials. What social movement leaders would tell us is that maybe we need to think about um, resources in a, in a different and additional way. And what they would tell us is that we should focus on our natural resources. And these are the resources that grow with use. Okay? The more we use them, the more of them we have. It's fantastic. And um, you know, some of those ideas, um, the first one is about discretionary effort, and I'll, I'll talk to you about that um, shortly, about you know, how we, um, uh, because we make a connection with people and what matters to them, that, that people will give us so much more of their own um, energy and effort also by building relationships and asking people to commit. Look at those two words again, relationship and commitment. We'll see those time and time again. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, discretionary effort. Okay? Just the science of discretionary effort. Basically, it's what we willingly do because we want to. So in my um, spare time, I'm a volunteer for the British Red Cross. Okay? I'm one of 33,000 people in Britain who volunteer for the Red Cross. Okay? That is discretionary effort. I do that because I love the Red Cross and what it stands for and it fits with my humanitarian um, principles. But discretionary effort isn't just what we do as a volunteer. It's what we do in our jobs every day. And what the evidence tells us is that where we feel engaged with the organisation, with its values, with its direction, we will do 30 to 40% more work. Okay? And the extent to which we are interested and involved in assisting the organisation in accomplishing its goals is the extent to which we feel connected and we will use our discretionary effort. For most organisations, it is an unmanaged and unrealised um, uh, resource. Now, at this point, I'm going to bring uh, Maxine in. And just to tell you that um, Maxine is um, a leader in, in, um, in hospital systems that has been utilising these um, principles from community organising and social movements in, um, in, in um, her hospital system. So I just wanted to kind of stop and pause here, uh, Maxine, and to ask you, in terms of you know, what we've looked at um, so far and thinking about discretionary effort, um, resources... You know, what's, what's kind of your reflection on that and some of your experience? Um, good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to be here with you. Um, I suppose from my point of view, I, I'm a nurse and I've been in the UK health system for 30 years. Um, and it's a great place to be. And if, we, if I go back a slide and talk and think about commitment, because the commitment and the discretion go together, um, we're really lucky in, in the um, UK healthcare system. We had um, Bevan, who in 1948 
gave us a great purpose really which is to ensure that our population, our citizens actually get the care they need when they need it, irrelevant of their ability to pay or their educational background or their class, the class system they come from. And it's something that we, we try and protect um, really strongly within the, the UK healthcare system and it's under threat at the moment. Um, the reforms threaten that, that and it's something we're working hard to make sure that we protect. When you talk to staff, my experience is, when you talk to staff about that fundamental principle of the UK healthcare system, you, you get tapped into their commitment straight away. And I think it's about thinking through how do we reconnect staff, and that's what this work's done for us in, in Middlesbrough in the northeast of England. How do you reconnect 7,500 staff? to the purpose of what we do in the NHS and I think it's really interesting and, and easy I suppose to think about the commitment issue um, and discretionary effort being warm and fuzzy and it makes us all feel nice in this, in this hall today but actually the evidence base is really clear that 30 to 40 percent of extra effort is free, it costs us nothing. My hospital spends £500 million of public money every year in the UK healthcare system and we can have 30 to 40% extra effort if we get the commitment right from the staff. So that, that for me is some of the, the motivational stuff around the commitment work. Yeah, fantastic. So, you know, we talk about resource, and, and, and as, um, as Maxine said, you know, this, this resource that is, that is there for us. I say this resource is there in our own staff, and this resource is there all around us in our communities and in the bigger system. And, you know, the, what we learn, again, from, um, from social movement thinking is about that we need to shift the power. And very often, you know, the situations that we find ourselves in are situations of power over which means that we're in a hierarchy and somebody has uh, more power than other people. And how can we shift that and uh, move to power with? So what I just wanted to show you um, is, a, is a specific example of some work that I'm involved in at the moment using these principles. Um, this was a headline from um, an English newspaper um, last week. Locked up and sedated. Dementia patients being denied basic rights, says um, a damning report. Um, we have um, an intolerable situation in our country. Basically, we have 180,000 people with dementia who are being prescribed antipsychotic anti drugs. Um, and um, our experts reckon that about two-thirds of those people um, with dementia should not be getting antipsychotic drugs. So, um, you know, there's a cost issue. It means that we're spending about £30, £30 million pounds a year giving antipsychotic drugs that, um, that shouldn't be being given. There's a, a massive um, quality and experience issue because essentially, um, you know, um, what the, um, the research is saying is that about 120,000 people with dementia are being chemically coshed, are being sedated to be kept quiet. Um, inappropriately. Um, every year about um, uh, 1,800 people die as a result of, um, of uh, being given antipsychotic drugs um, in, this, in this context. About um, 1,600 people um, have a stroke and um, we have a, a, a moral imperative to put right this, um, this terrible wrong. So we are utilising these mobilising principles and, and we have a call to action. Okay? And our call to action is that by the 31st of March next year that all 180,000 people with dementia who are receiving antipsychotic drugs will have undergone um, a clinical review. But also, just reviewing the people that are currently on antipsychotic drugs isn't enough. Because if we achieved our goal by next March, we could come back another year later and there would be another 180,000 people with dementia on antipsychotic drugs. So we actually want to put the system right so that you know, in future people with dementia are not prescribed antipsychotics unless their situation um, fits the guidelines. So, you know, what I'd say about this, the, the challenge, is that it's recognised in our system that this is a very bad thing that needs to change. But 
there's lots of activity going on all over the place. There's lots of people working on this in different ways, in different settings. And the problem is that whilst there's lots of activity and energy for change, unless that activity gets channeled into appropriate prescribing and reviewing medication, you know, it counts for nothing. And I think too often in health and healthcare, we have a thousand flowers blooming. We have people taking action all over the place on the same issue, but it doesn't come together to, to create um, or to achieve a goal. So, you know, thinking about this from um, the point of view of our um, social movement ideas, we need to think, who are we going to call to action? Okay. What actions we want them to take? And what support and resources are available to help them to take their action? So when we think about the who, and we analyse this, you know, we want to put this situation right by, the, by next March, in a year. Clearly we need to call to action the clinical decision makers. Okay, take the action, but also we want to shift the power in the system. We want to shift it to people with dementia and their carers. And carer in, um, in this um, context means, um, means family member. Um, and in a sense, what we want is people with dementia and their carers knocking on the door of their GP and saying, I, I want a clinical review. We want um, you know, people knocking on the door of care homes to say, you know, what's happening here? What do we need to do? So we also want to organise those who can um, give voice and advocacy with, for two people with dementia and their carers. And, um, and so we're talking, you know, voluntary sector organisations, advocacy organisations, and finally, those with authority who can promote and ensure best practice. And that's everybody from the boards of hospitals um, and um, uh, mental health organisations, its regulators, its commissioners of care, uh, its people that run care homes. So I want to show you um, a specific call to action, and this is a little bit busy. Um, the group that I've picked on here is, is pharmacists. Okay? What social movement thinking tells us, if we want to call people to action, okay, we need to call them to take a specific action. It's not enough to say, will you commit to helping us achieve this goal by the 31st of March? Because we'd all want to commit. But, you know, committing to an outcome isn't enough. We need to commit to a specific action. And we need to be clear what that action is and then to, to, to get that whole community taking that action. So, you know, what we have here is um, the action for pharmacists to take, to identify from their own pharmacy register people um, who are being prescribed antipsychotics, and also to work in partnership with prescribing colleagues, with psychiatrists, with GPs, with hospital doctors to review each individual. And again, you know, what you can see here are some specific themes for action that underpin that specific action. But for each group that we're working with, you know, we're getting them to organise themselves. So the pharmacists are organising themselves, the GPs are organising themselves, the care homes are organising themselves. And what we're identifying is the one action that we want them all to take. So just um, very um, quickly, just to go through the, um, the, other, um, the other side of things, if you like, and, and thinking about narrative. You know, the evidence tells us really clearly that if we want to motivate people to take action, okay, if we want action for change, for quality, safety and um, uh, cost improvement, that um, we, know we have to motivate people. And the way, that the, the, the way that we motivate people is by making a connection with emotions through values. And, and I think that we have to build these principles you know, uh, much more clearly into our change processes. And I think that too often in, in quality improvement, we're very focused on metrics and, and data and seven points on the run chart, and all that is important. You know? But um, if we don't make the connection... Um, with emotion, we will not achieve change at scale. Now, the thing is that not all emotions um, are equal. So, um, there are um, emotions that are action motivators. Okay? These, are the, um, these are the emotions that um, uh, encourage people to, to take action. And what these emotions do is that they overcome these other emotions that are inhibitors of action. Okay. So as leaders, as mobilising leaders, we need to be thinking, you know, what can we be doing to, to build these action motivators to enable people um, to, to, uh, to take change? 
And again, the other thing that the evidence tells us really strongly, the most effective way of doing this is through storytelling, through narrative. So what we've got to be able to do as mobilising leaders is to tell a very compelling story that calls people to action. And the method that, that we're using is called public narrative. And what we basically do is that we work with leaders. And the first thing we do is that we, we help leaders, coach leaders, to tell their story of self. And their story of self is, in a, in a sense, who I am, why I am called to do the job that I do, my values, my experiences. Then we move on to the story of us. And the story of us is about how we come together as a community to, um, to achieve a goal. So again, if we think about the dementia project, um, the, the, the project for, for um, people um, taking antipsychotics who have dementia, you know, the us there is a really big us. It's people that live with dementia and their families, it's the voluntary sector, it's the private sector care home, it's psychiatrists, pharmacists, GPs, um, hospital doctors, and so on and so on. And in a sense, through this story, we create a profound sense of us. You know, we come together on this common task. But having, telling our own story and creating a sense of us isn't enough. What we've then got to do is make that into a call to action. You know, this is the specific action we want you to take. Okay? And we want you to take it now. We create this profound um, sense of urgency. And it's by bring, bringing all three together, my own story, how I connect with everybody else um, as an us, and this urgent call to action that, um, that, that we create the starting point for um, profound action. I was just going to quickly hand over um, to Maxine again, so just tell us some of your experiences about, about stories. Yeah, we've, we've been using narrative um, work within the organisation since about um, 2005, and I, what Helen asked me to do is just give you some, some practical examples of where we've used that. So I'll start with the frontline staff. Um, I think what we've found, um, my personal experience, is with, with nurses who've, who've actually lost hope that we can actually change the system in a way that's good for patients and for caregivers, we found that in, in enabling them to reconnect with their own story of why they came to the NHS and why they've stayed and persevered and, and link them back to that, their, their own values and beliefs about the NHS and now what they've got to do now has been really quite profound. I had an experience um, last week in our own organisation working with a ward and went with a ward that's got itself into difficulty um, and I've been interviewing 38 staff and spending 38 hours with, with staff on, on a one hour individual session and finding people as they tell their story yourself has, been, has made me realise how powerful that is. I found a, a girl who had, for 20 years had wanted to be a nurse and she was working in our organisation as a healthcare assistant. And she'd previously spent 20 years as an undertaker's embalmer with harbouring this vision of, of trying to be a healthcare giver. And she, that woman has so much to offer. Nobody knew her story. Nobody else in that ward and department knew how long and how hard that woman had actually worked to come to the NHS to be able to deliver the work that she wanted to do and the commitment she wanted to offer. So we found that actually at an individual level there's lots of applications of this public narrative work. At a corporate level um, we found that it is the best way to translate strategy into a meaningful communication and dialogue with frontline staff. We've never been able to do it as well as we have now. We've never been able to create stories of now and of us in the same way as we do now. It hasn't been without its challenges. Um, it, it does come with a health warning. Um, not everybody feels very comfortable when you start this work about sharing some of your authentic self and deciding which part of you you want to put on shore. Some people find that very threatening, but our own experience is if you persevere with that, there's some great benefits to be taken. Oh, thanks, Maxine. That was terrific. So, just something else I wanted to say about um, narrative. You know, there's this myth around that um, it isn't possible to engage clinical staff on the cost improvement um, agenda because people don't want to hear it. Okay? I just say that it's complete rubbish. Okay? That, that it's very easy to engage clinical staff on a cost improvement agenda. But it's how we get the story across. It's the narrative um, that we create around it. And, and again, just very much tying in with what... Uh, Maxine was saying that, um, you know, when we talk about, about quality and, and cost improvement and, and the narrative behind that, 
um, it isn't so much about um, improving quality and safety and reducing costs. It's actually, for us, about securing the future of our National Health Service. You know, in terms of many of the things that we have taken for granted for, for so long. Um, in terms of the kind of comprehensive care that we get, that, that in a sense all of us have to be um, called to action to, to, to play our part to secure that. And uh, one of the things that we brought with us um, is, is this. And, um, and, and again, this is another example of where we've been using these um, social movement um, principles. And um, this is uh, an initiative in the National Health Service which is called Energise for Excellence. And it's a call to action um, for nurses and midwives. And the goal is for 200,000 nurses and midwives to take action around improving quality and reducing cost. And I've bought um, a few copies of this and I've left them uh, on, on the front here if you'd like them. But I think this is, um, you know, this group of, of um, nursing and midwifery leaders um, wrote this and wrote the call to action as, as a public narrative. And, and I think it's one of the best narratives I've ever seen around a call to action on quality and cost improvement. So, um, you know, I'd recommend either come and get one from the front or there's a website there um, where you can get it as well. So we're coming to the end of our session now. Um, just a couple more things to say. You know, when we talk about these, taking these principles and approaches, how are they additional to what we typically do? Again, they're not an alternative, they're additional. So let's think about a classic um, NHS project in our system. You know, um, a, a typical quality or safety improvement project. We would have a project team. We would have a senior sponsor, the chief exec or the director of nursing or the medical director so that the hierarchy was, um, was embedded. We would have some project resources, you know, a project budget and a few people to work with us. And we would have some, um, some metrics and milestones, some key performance indicators. And we would have clear accountability through the programme hierarchy. In terms of an organising project, you know, bringing these mobilising leadership approaches, what we, would, um, what we would also seek to do is, first of all, to build much broader um, support. So like now, in the work that I'm doing using these um, approaches, I'm working as much with the voluntary sector and the private sector and people that use services as I am with NHS staff, and that's a big difference. And in a sense, what we've got to be able to do is to create an us, you know, a sense of coming together around a common improvement agenda and a now, a call to action. We have um, additional project resources because we build those through the relationships and the commitments. And again, if you look at that dementia example, um, it's amazing how many people are out there who are resources to help us um, in our calls. In a sense, we've just not organised before. We've just not come together around a common cause. We build relational commitment to change. In a sense, you know, the people from Dementia UK or the Alzheimer's Society, who are the main charitable bodies that we're working with, or the leaders of the private sector care homes, I can't hold them to account through a programme hierarchy because I don't, you know, um, we're not in the same organisation. We're in different organisations, but we have a common goal. So we build relational commitment to change. In a sense, I commit to them and they commit to me in relationship to take action. We build commitment to take specific actions. So I showed you the specific action for the pharmacists, but there's also a specific action for voluntary sector organisations, for people with dementia in their families, for GPs, for hospital doctors, and so on. And we're seeking to utilise the incredible resources that we have to actually shift power in the system towards people with dementia um, and, um, and their families, towards people working on the front line of care and, and whatever um, other example we have. And finally, um, I want to end with a quote because I think all of us, you know, as mobilising leaders, we, we have a choice. And I know this is a bit cheesy, but it's the quote that I have um, on my wall in my office. Um, this is the true joy of life. The being used up for a purpose, recognised by yourself as a mighty one. Being a force of nature, instead of a feverish, selfish, little clot of ailments and grievances, complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. And I think each of us, you know, we have a choice when it comes to um, health and healthcare improvement. We can choose to be a force of nature. 
We can identify the other resources, the other people that we can, we can link with to shift the power in the system to get the change we want. Or we can sit there and say, well, I'd like to do it, but I can't really make a difference. Um, I know which choice I'm making, and I hope that um, you make the same one. So um, on behalf of Maxine and I, thank you. I think we maybe have time for a couple of questions. There's, there's loads of copies, by the way, and um, if you don't get one now, we can get you one, so don't worry. Okay. Any questions or comments? I think we've run out of time anyway, so yeah, thank you. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Nixon. Yeah. Sorry. All right, we're going to move on to the next uh, uh, presentation. And this is on the quality continuum, how it all end, uh, joins up. And this will be delivered by two speakers. One is Dr. John Dean, uh, who had, John has been a medical director of uh, NHS Bolton since 2006. Uh, and in this role, he has uh, held uh, executive responsibility for clinical quality. He led the development and implementation of a three-year quality strategy for provider services and commissioning. Now, John is also a, uh, he was formerly an IHI fellow uh, and has uh, done some time uh, learning at the IHI Institute in the US, uh, as well as worked with the Royal College of Physicians in London on Teams Without Walls. He was also chair of clinical pathways for adults and elderly for NHS Northwest in 2009 as well as 2010. Now, together with John, we have um, Michael Robinson, whose um, uh, background is in zoology and physiotherapy. And uh, Michael um, has been with Bolton uh, Trust in 2001 as well as um, in 2006. And then since then has been working um, uh, in Bolton uh, together with John. In 2009, Michael took up his current post as Assistant Director of Clinical Governance uh, where he focuses on clinical quality, patient safety, independent contractor performance, research governance throughout the Bolton health economy. So um, it is with great pleasure that I welcome John and Michael. Yes. Thank you, Nelly. <clears throat> So uh, I'm John Dean uh, and my colleague Mike Robinson and I are aiming uh, over about the next 30 minutes to share with you a concept that we call the quality continuum. We're going to describe to you what we mean by the quality continuum and we're going to use uh, examples, real life examples, that show how using this concept and this approach is, we believe, the way to achieve measurable sustainable and continuous improvement in clinical quality. So there are a number of approaches that have been used over the years to try and improve the quality of health care with very variable success. Some of these you'll see presented at this meeting, others will be showcased in other meetings and other forums or in other ways. And I've observed even in people interested in quality improvement, an element of competition and rivalry between different methods and approaches to improving clinical quality. Now, organisations necessarily, organisations necessarily uh, place a significant amount of resource into quality assurance. Assurance for regulatory standards to make sure that those standards are being achieved, either so that they can be licensed uh, or that they can have external recognition for a basic quality standard uh, of care. And in the UK, this has been through the Health Care Commission and the Care Quality Commission more recently, as well as through professional bodies. So quality assurance is a significant amount of resource going into quality assurance, certainly in the UK and the NHS, and I'm sure in other healthcare systems. Measurement and feedback 
uh, measuring clinical performance and the outcomes of that clinical performance, particularly when that is open and attributable to individual clinicians or indi individual services and compared to peers, perhaps linked to financial incentives and paper performance, we know has demonstrated uh, uh, improvements in standards of care. And there are presentations again at this meeting where that has been demonstrated and presentations from our own organisation this afternoon that show that in UK primary care. And measuring and feedback against standards in the form of clinical audit has been a very popular approach for many decades. But it's been criticised. It's been criticised because of the rarity of completing the audit cycle, uh, because uh, instituting change has not always happened and because of the lengthy time frame of it for improvement to occur. Um, incident reporting, complaints, poor performance reporting, are certainly key methods for improving the quality of care. However, multiple actions uh, to prevent recurrence and, and cause improvement are necessary to address practitioner performance uh, and continued measurement of that performance is necessary if we're going to see improvement. Within the United Kingdom and the NHS, uh, the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, NICE, has now published literally hundreds of clinical guidelines and assessed many, many clinical techniques and technologies. And whilst each NHS organisation uh, for regulatory reasons has to state that it is compliant with these, when you actually measure clinical practice through audit, we find there remain great variations in clinical practice uh, and much evidence-based practice is not being delivered to patients. Con education and training and continued professional development uh, are essential uh, not only increasingly is that necessary for professional regulation uh, uh, linked to appraisal, revalidation, relicensing, but historically most professionals have seen this as the key way of improving their clinical practice and the clinical outcomes for their patients. But they commonly, and we commonly, find it very difficult to consistently implement that standard of care within the system of healthcare, within the environment of healthcare in which we're working. At this meeting, you'll see a large amount around uh, process standardisation as the predominant method of quality improvement. It is the dominant method that we'll see at this meeting, but it is only one of many approaches. It can be linked to best practice through care bundles and we know it is an effective approach in that way, particularly if there's continued measurement of compliance to those care bundles. But it's common that we hear that it doesn't get clinical engagement, that it doesn't get all staff engaged in that. Others will argue that all these things are well and good, but the level of change, the level of improvement that's required needs fundamentally different ways of working and that we actually need innovation. We need to maximise the use of emerging technologies, uh, emer emerging behaviours to get radical change and that innovation is the way forward. And universities uh, uh, and, and uh, academic medical centres, industries have put huge research, huge resource into research uh, and to new treatments, new knowledge of disease, of healthcare, of its effectiveness. So again, a huge resource going into research and development. But we would propose, and the purpose of this symposium is to propose, that any one of these approaches is insufficient to improve clinical quality and that only by integrating these into what we call the quality continuum can significant and sustained improvements be delivered. Thank you, John. Good morning, everybody. I would ask you all to, to consider from the slide above how many of the above approaches are going to be included in this following patient story. Now Mr X, which isn't a common name in Bolton, I hasten to add, had atrial fibrillation and had been under the anticoagulation clinic at the hospital for a number of years. 
where he went to have his bloods monitored and to have his anticoagulation therapy modified as appropriate. But he had a history of non-attendance at the clinic and this was largely due to the difficulties in getting to the clinic, the long waits whilst he was at clinic for venous testing and also the lack of face-to-face -face contact. If he did attend, he would also have to wait long periods to have his yellow book, which is his patient held monitoring record, updated and that would subsequently be posted onto him. Then he would have to either modify his own dose from a supply of medication or he'd then have to attend his GP practice in order to get a repeat prescription. Now not all GPs but the most conscientious GPs would require sight of Mr X's yellow book in order to determine the exact needs of his repeat prescription which again would require him to leave his yellow book at the GP surgery. So unsurprisingly, Mr X stopped attending both the hospital clinic and his GPs, but incidentally continued to receive his repeat prescription. And it wasn't until a vigilant prescribing support pharmacist who was doing a routine audit of the GP's repeat prescribing policy actually noted this and reported it as a clinical incident. Now this is just one example of a number of incidents that have been reported which highlight failings in the system and the potential for harm. Anticoagulants are frequently identified as causing preventable harm and unnecessary admissions to hospital. So better management clearly has advantages. And in fact in 2007 the National Patient Safety Agency in the UK issued a patient safety alert following collaboration with the British Society of Haematology and a number of other clinical organisations, including patient forums. NHS Bolton, in response to this, elected to move the service from the hospital and into a community setting. But this was only enabled by embracing the innovation of near patient testing and also the DAWN software system. The service was also run by clinical nurse specialists in an environment that was actually fit for purpose. Mr X still had difficulty attending clinic but he did benefit from a specific appointment time and also not having to undergo venous testing. He liked the face-to-face -face contact that he now experienced and it, with the nurses who were able to discuss not only concerns he had but also additional treatments he may need to undertake and much to Mr X's delight, they were able to update the yellow book there and then within the same appointment. This rapid turnaround and more personalised care certainly improved compliance. And the added presence of an independent nurse prescriber within the clinic enabled initiation of any modification to his therapy to take place there and then. Mr X actually is now able to attend one of the eight outreach clinics which have recently been developed which is even easier for him and even further improves compliance. But if he failed to attend on three separate occasions then his repeat prescription would stop because they were unable to monitor his bloods. His GP, specialist if appropriate and Mr X would be advised of this. Now the DAWN system provides a database for patient details regarding anticoagulation including clinical indication, length of treatment and clinical correspondence. It's a fully automated system, it calculates the dose from inputted data and then automatically emails the GP where the results are reconciled into the patient's GP records to enable accurate repeat prescribing in the future. This certainly has reduced errors associated with Mr X either losing or failing to present his yellow book and it alerts the GP to other factors such as other medications that might affect his blood results such as antibiotics. Most GP practices subscribe to this within Bolton and we've been able to tackle responsibilities around prescribing, dispensing, dangers with the drug and this has led to a continuous programme of education and competency training. The medicines team audits against GP repeat prescribing policies for high drugs to avoid such dangers as described earlier. 
Further recent improvements have also been around near patient testing of housebound patients at home and also the rapid anticoagulation of patients who develop new DVTs and this has significantly reduced the period of which they have to be heparinized. When benchmarked three years ago, Bolton ranked 56th out of 88 organizations who were using the DAWN system. And this is based on the length of time they remain within recommended INR range. But via a system of continuous service improvement, Bolton now rates 23rd out of 99 organizations. But this isn't the only benefit. I think if you remember back to yesterday morning and Maureen's opening uh, keynote speech, I think if you can't reduce the burden of the illness, atrial fibrillation in this case, then we certainly would want to reduce the burden of the treatment. There are three perspectives that we'd like to share with you of what we're calling the quality continuum. The first is that of the organisation or the profession or the expert. And we know that if we measure clinical quality in, in any field over a large enough population or a large enough number of services, what we get is a normal distribution, uh, a bell-shaped curve of quality. Now within that we have what is normal practice and hopefully somewhere within that is what is good practice. In addition, we can define what is not acceptable practice, what is below a threshold uh, of poor practice. And we can see what is possible in terms of excellent practice. The aim, of course, is to shift the curve to the right and to increase the amount of people, the amount of professionals and the number of patients receiving good care and improving care. So for the organisation to do that, we need a whole series of mechanisms in order to ensure that it can happen. On the left hand side of the curve, we need mechanisms for identifying and managing error and poor performance. And there may be a number of measures at this end of the curve uh, which, which give assurance that we're above the minimum standard that's required, either internally opposed or externally because of regulatory uh, 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 measures. To maintain good practice, we need a whole series of things within the organisation that the organisation needs to set up or to facilitate. We must set and agree clinical standards, we must provide access to continuous professional development, we must provide access to information within the clinical interface to best practice, uh, to guidance uh, uh, and to the locally agreed uh, pathways uh, of care. We must agree locally the most effective treatments, the most effective pathways that are there uh, uh, for the local population so that patients can receive the best available uh, care. And reliably implementing best practice, as we've already stated, is challenging without local system change, local changes to processes at a microsystem level and the quality improvement methodologies and skills for implementing change in order to achieve that and sustain it. All staff need to be in that cycle of continuous improvement, of appraisal, it may be linked to revalidation. And if a reflective environment and approach is, 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 is developed for appraisal, then many of these components that we've already considered can be embedded within the appraisal and development process. But to continually move the curve to the right, we also need research and innovation within the organisation, tapping into other organisations as well, bringing that learning in and making that standardised and consistent and implemented and sustainable practice. So we need to have mechanisms within the organisation to develop all of those and, and to sustain all of those. Underpinning that, we need systems of measurement. We need strong uh, leadership uh, that is focused on clinical quality as a key aim uh, of the organisation. And we need a governance system that assures the board and the leadership that all of these components are working and are working together uh, uh, and continually improving the quality of care. 
So that's the organisational perspective in terms of the quality continuum. But this is what I would call the patient perspective of the quality continuum. From the patient's point of view, it's the continuum of care. Knowing what to do in terms of self-care, having the relevant information available. If they have a chronic condition, having the skills and information and support to manage that condition both at times of stability and times of exacerbation. To have a confidence that within the primary care setting they're receiving the best care and that the outcomes of care are continually improving. To do the same within specialty care and uh, in the transitions uh, between each of these components of care. So that wherever that care is being delivered, the patient has the knowledge that the best care is being delivered, the confidence to, to, to carry out that care in partnership with the healthcare system. Now key, of course, to the patient continuum is transitions and is good communication across, across those transitions. But also key, I believe, and we believe, is a culture, a culture that each component of the system shares responsibility for that whole continuum of care. So whether you're in primary care, whether you're in public health, whether you're in specialty care, you share a responsibility for that patient's quality of care across their continuum of care. It may be the error that occurs in primary care or specialty care or the poor practice that occurs there is actually picked up in another part of the system. So poor performance in primary care may only be picked up by specialty care and vice versa. Best practice, education and training, skills for quality improvement, skills for research and development, governance structures and support may sit in any of these components and be more or less developed. But if shared across that continuum of care, then that's when we start to get, from the patient's perspective, uh, continuous improvement wherever and as they transition between care settings. So the culture within the organisation and within the clinical professionals of responsibility across the continuum is key. And the third perspective on the, con on the quality continuum is the quality for the population, the quality of health, the quality of life, and the quality of care that they receive. So within care for a population, and within Bolton we care for a population and try and improve the health and health care for around 280,000 people, but within that and within any population there will be a number of health care organisations, there will be voluntary sector, there will be other uh, uh, components within the system trying to enable good health and, and good health care. Within each organisation there will be multiple clinics, multiple departments that need to be working together, sharing responsibility, sharing skills in order to improve the health and health care for the population. But who takes responsibility for that continuous improvement for the population? Someone has to take that coordinating role. And what we've seen through being part of the Triple AAA community, and you'll hear this at this meeting, is that doesn't need to be necessarily prescribed by the healthcare system. Any component of the system can take that leadership and ownership to coordinate and enable coordination for the local population. So within the healthcare system, health and care system, there will be a very large number of people working on each of these elements that can improve quality and continuously improve that. I've heard the argument many, many times, how do we get the capacity for quality improvement within our healthcare system? If you look at each of those components that we described earlier, and you look at the workforce within your local health system for a population that is working on everything from assurance to standards to quality improvement, process improvement, R&D, I would put to you, you have a massive workforce that is working on quality improvement and continuous improvement. The question is, how do we coordinate and bring that workforce together so that it's working in a coordinated and consistent way uh, to maximise uh, the opportunities?
Now, there are numerous <laughs> examples of how quality and safety can be improved using the quality continuum. The quality continuum we see above. And we've already used the example of anticoagulation, where a high risk of identifiable harm through error reporting led to national regulation and to the local innovation and technology to create a more patient-centred and safer care environment. The second local example we'd like to share with you is the approach to healthcare associated infections. Because we believe this is an approach of joining up the quality continuum where our results in this area wouldn't have been as good without the model of the quality continuum. Reducing infections has been a National Health Service priority for a number of years. Infection rates and achieving local targets became core standards assessed by the NHS, both in hospitals, community settings and in other healthcare organisations. Nationally agreed standard <coughs> care bundles or high impact interventions were developed and adopted locally for high risk procedures and for high risk patients, as well as stringent hand washing guidance and guidance on antibiotic prescribing. Key to these high impact interventions, however, was an audit against compliance, feedback to frontline staff and the open display of results. Bolton's NHS hospital has approximately 700 inpatient beds dealing with both elective care and with emergency care patients. In line with the above described national driver, the hospital determined that it, it was a significant, that it needed a significant action plan if it was to achieve the aims set out. Approximately 15% of the cases of infections, however, at the hospital were associated with critical care. A root cause analysis was used to diagnose the issues and inform the action plans so that you could get maximum impact in the areas required. A zero tolerance approach was also adopted, which was take, which a zero tolerance approach was taken with detailed multidisciplinary investigation of each case. So within the critical care area, there was an apparent lack of leadership poor practice and a culture that accepted only partial compliance with the care bundles and high impact interventions. In addition to this, there was also an apparent culture of denial. Staff feeling they weren't part of the problem, being divorced from both the problem and from the solutions that were necessary. The scrutiny increased, as expected, a defensive attitude increased as well and it took considerable organisational leadership focus on, focusing on this as a priority, with executive and clinical leadership reporting on actions and outcomes to assure the Bolton Hospital Board. Now the persistent results of audits began to change attitudes by demonstrating beyond doubt that practices were far from ideal and that these staff could improve their practice and in turn could improve their outcomes. And this approach had similar effects in other clinical areas. But I think it's important to realise that this isn't just a hospital problem. Tackling healthcare associated infections is a problem for the entire health economy. Root cause analysis was further developed to involve community and primary care staff, as well as hospital staff, basically wherever the infection started. Specialist nurses also developed collaborative improvement projects within nursing care homes aimed at preventing infections. This is essentially an education program which aims to change behaviour, promote incident reporting and audit outcomes in relation to infections in care homes. Over 90% of the care homes in Bolton now subscribe to this program and it's also been developed to be offered to GP practices and dental practices. The specialist nurses also work with the, uh, the medicines management team to promote and audit the appropriate prescribing of antibiotics, this being a particular problem in the elderly population in relation to the infection Clostridium difficile. Results fed back to GPs, both from audit and root cause analysis, 
resulted in the development of, for example, computer alerts on their systems and simple posters summarising the first and second line treatment options for the most commonly encountered infections, and this was rolled out to all practices. And in fact, a repeat audit of this demonstrated improved adherence to the guidelines. Clinical and managerial leadership was involved in infection prevention and control. And these formally collaborated to reduce the chance of infections in all settings and across settings. This is led by a director of infection control within the health economy. And an infection control committee meets quarterly to formally communicate between, for example, tissue viability nurses, pharmacists, medics, microbiologists, nurses and allied health professionals. It addresses all aspects from current infection rates through education and practice to estates and even procurement. And the director reports to the NHS board with evidenced assurance. So a culture is therefore created of mutual support across the health economy in the commitment to reduce infections. This not only enables faster identification and the initiation of immediate actions to tackle the infections, but it's also created an environment which enables the sharing of any lessons learned and informs the health and estate strategy accordingly. We've got some results for you here. In 2008 in Bolton, MRSA bacteremia rates were at 31 a year. These reduced to 9 a year, as you can see from the top graph there, in 2009-10, and I'm pleased to report that in 2010-11, they've reduced again to just 4 bacteremias within the year. Clostridium difficile rates were 214 in 2008, but as you can see from the graph above there, this fell to 52 in 2009-10, and again I'm pleased to report that this has fallen further to 44 in 2010-11. Sustained improvements below expected infection rates is now becoming a reality, and it's consistently achieved. But there are two challenges still ahead. One is sustaining this progress, and the second is tackling new infections as they emerge. But we do believe we've got a model, or we are developing a model throughout the health economy that's essential in enabling us to achieve this. So as I've, as I've already said, NHS Bolton uh, has the responsibility uh, for the health and health care for the local population of 280,000 people, working with its partners in the NHS and outside the NHS to do that. Within NHS Bolton, we formed a directorate of clinical quality that incorporates all the elements of the quality continuum uh, that we've, that we've uh, covered. There are senior officers with responsibility for specific elements that are shown on this slide. And as medical director, I'm responsible to the board uh, for clinical quality and present a monthly quality report to the board which covers many of these areas. We work within the directorate and to join up our action plans around all of these areas, but importantly we have absolutely explicit mechanisms for linking outside the directorate, for example, uh, with complaints, with contracting so that the quality and standards are, 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 are in uh, contracts with our major providers, with patient engagement to understand patient perspective and help with communication, and with information so that we can ensure there's continuous measurement of improvement, particularly around our, our biggest goals. And our experience now is that what we see is that any one of these elements may be a trigger for a piece of work. So there may be a trigger around a new treatment or a new pathway. There may be a trigger around a safety event. There may be a, a trigger that comes from, from practitioners saying they need education in an area. But the action plan will need to incorporate many of these components together, working together, in order to achieve a sustainable improvement. Any one on its own will not do that. And also within Bolton, uh, we have a governance structure which is shown here. 
But it's not the structure, really, which delivers that. I think it embeds it, it gives us governance, and it gives us assurance. But actually, again, it's the culture that this creates. So within each health, major healthcare provider, there will, again, be governance structures for quality and safety, uh, and we encourage those to be joined up in the way that I've shown so that the elements can be considered together. But each provider, be that the hospital, mental health services, community provider, independent GPs or dentists, independent sector such as private hospitals, all report in around these quality areas to our assurance committee, the Qu Clinical Governance and Quality Improvement Committee, which on behalf of the board scrutinises that to assure that all of these actions are being taken forward. So there's an understanding around the assurance, there's an understanding that everybody is partners in the health economy for the population. Separately to that, but equally if not more important, are health economy groups that look specifically at patient safety, not for assurance, but actually for learning uh, and sharing and, and jointly uh, uh, tackling problems. So the health economy safety meeting is a learning and sharing meeting where we'll look at significant events, where we'll look at new programs and we'll ensure that we're working together uh, and learning together uh, to improve patient safety. Similarly, the Clinical Standards Board uh, has cl clinical leaders, managerial leaders, key officers from the uh, 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 NHS Bolton uh, who will agree clinical standards, pathways, uh, uh, effective treatments, a local formulary of medicines for the health economy and the audit that need to take place. And the key officers will take forward implementation uh, uh, of that. So a governance structure, important, it embeds the culture, but actually it's how that's used uh, that's important. So our challenge to you this morning is for you to think about your healthcare system for your local population to think about the components of the quality continuum and who is working on them. Are there any gaps? Are there any areas where actually we need to shift resources between assurance, innovation, quality improvement, pathways, clinical effectiveness? Because there's your workforce for continuous quality improvement. Bring them together, make sure they're working together that there's no duplication of work, and I can tell you when you start to look at it, there is a huge amount of duplication of work, so that we're all working together on this. So are they joined up? And how can you make them joined up within your organisation, across the patient journey, and across the healthcare system? So as we've worked on this for a few years, and it's a continuing journey, we certainly haven't perfected it, but we believe that this, this is the direction uh, of travel that we need to continue. We've had real barriers and real challenges. And some of those I've outlined here, they're about cultural differences, and cultural differences bring competition. So does one component of the healthcare system, does primary care or specialty care, have a different culture? Absolutely. Does it believe that it has the answers to health care? Sometimes, at, at expense of the others, and a competitive nature on you know, who's the most important in this, who's going to make the biggest contribution. There are also cultural differences uh, with, between departments. There are cultural differences in approach to assurance, in approach to innovation, in approach to clinical standards, in appraisal and revalidation, in education and the leading people in those areas. And they will be competing. They will be thinking that professional education is the most important, or innovation is most important, or assurance is most important. And they'll have different lines of accountability, either within their organisations or within their professional groupings. The ways that have helped us to start to overcome this have been, and this comes back to Helen's talk earlier, that a common purpose, a sense, building a sense of common purpose across the population. And we've used the triple aim for that and we find that has you know, great clarity for healthcare workers and the population and patients themselves in terms of what we're there for. So that's brought a common language, a common purpose. The second is the cultural change around openness and honesty. 
when things have gone wrong, when things, haven't gone, when things have gone well, how we share that, how we share that learning, how we share that expertise. So if the quality improvement in, it, it, uh, expertise is in the hospital, how can that work with primary care or the voluntary sector to improve uh, care in those areas and, and vice versa? That whole sharing and learning in culture and environment uh, is what needs to be created. But it's sustained and it's developed because of consistent leadership across the board uh, with a message uh, for quality and a, and a key objective around clinical quality by all board members and all leaders uh, across the system. So I hope we managed to share with you this morning what, we call, what we're calling the quality continuum. The different components from an organisational professional perspective the continuum from the patient's perspective across all care settings and the continuum that needs to embrace the whole of the population. I hope we've been able to share with you a couple of examples that show how we believe only by bringing these all together can we really get that most sustained improvement for the patient and, and the population. And we look forward over the next five to ten minutes of discussing with you some of your examples, some of your challenges that you've had in addressing, I'm sure, the same problems and maybe some of your solutions that we can all learn from. So thank you for your time. I hope we can enter into some discussion now. So are there, are there any uh, questions or points that, that people in the audience want to make? I think there are some roving microphones. Perhaps we can have the lights up to help. Okay. So we haven't got time? I know. Mark just told me. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, it, we'll have some informal discussion. Mike and I are around. Uh, very happy to have informal discussions, some handouts at the front. Thank you for your time thank, and thanks, Nelly, for oh, this session. Right. Yeah. Yes. And really, I want to formally uh, thank uh, Dr. John Dean and uh, Michael Robinson for the enlightening presentation. You know, uh, my personal story with Bolton is indeed, you know, they have the attributes of what Helen Bevan was talking about, relationship and commitment. And the people that have hosted us from Singapore are just so warm and energized. So you know, on that note, and I thank all of you for joining us in this session. Uh, I think uh, now there is a keynote uh, address uh, in 10 minutes right now. Okay. Okay.